Well, hello, this is George Garrels of the Arizona Lasertron Center. In this session, we're gonna spend a little bit of time looking at how we set up our instruments, laser and mass spectrometer to do laser ablation, ICPMS analyses of uranium lead geochronology. As you know, this is a technique that is becoming uh, more and more popular these days. There are many labs being set up at this time to be able to do these kinds of analyses. So in this first session, what I'll do is tell you a little bit about how we set up the instruments. We'll show you the hardware, we'll show you the software. We're actually acquiring uranium lead data right now. So you'll see it uh, coming off the machines. And then in our second session, I'll show you a little bit about the data reduction software that we have created to handle the uranium lead geochronologic data. And then our, in our third session, that's gonna be the live session. We'll be back here in the lab with, uh, with the instrument running and you'll be able to ask questions and have some conversation about uranium lead geochronology. So let's just jump right in. First, we'll talk a little bit about the laser system. This is a, a Teledyne, machine, Teledyne Photon Machines uh, Analyte G2. It's an excimer laser. The wavelength is 193 nanometers. It's of course a pulsed laser. The laser duration is about uh, five nanoseconds. The uh, energy is quite adjustable. We generally run at about seven joules per square center, centimeter for this instrument. So one of the really awesome things about this instrument is the ablation cell. It's a helix two cell. And uh, the cell is designed to give you uh, laser pits of various diameters and then to efficiently extract out the material from the, from the ablation pit. The material goes through this peak tubing and, and then enters into the mass spectrometer here. So let me show you what the pits look like. This is just a, a, ski, a, a diagram showing some of the different pit diameters that we use. This is the smallest one we go to. It's about 10 microns in diameter, 15, 20, 25, 30, 40, 50. Rarely do we go up to 60 microns in diameter. And of course, to be able to do good uh, geochronology, you wanna have good laser pits. And these are really nice, nice flat floor, vertical walls no moat around the outside that tells us that the beam is aligned correctly and that the focus is, is set correctly. So these are, these are really nice laser pits. And what we try to do for uranium lead geochronology is drill down usually with a, a 30, 25 or 20 micron pit size such that the pit depth is less than half of the pit diameter. We find that the fractionation of lead to uranium increases dramatically when you get below about a half of a, a pit diameter. So these are just right for uranium lead geochronologic analyses. So there's nine uh, samples that are mounted in the chamber. They consist of a one inch diameter round epoxy puck. On each of the uh, sample mounts, we have the unknowns that we're interested in. And then we also have a series of zircon standards. Most of the minerals that we analyze are zircon because they contain a lot of uranium lead necessary for uranium lead geochronology. So what we do is you'll see when we go to the laser software as we go back and back and forth from the unknowns to the standards. And the reason that we have to do that is because the, the mass spectrometer um, and laser system is not able to generate isotope ratios that are exactly the correct ratio. And that's of course very challenging with any instrument. In this case, it's challenging, especially for the uranium lead ratio because uranium and lead have different size, different charge, different valence. valence. And so they behave differently in the laser pit, in the tubing, in the torch, all the way through the mass spectrometer. And we end up with about 10% fractionation of the uranium to lead isotopes. And so we have to correct for that. And that's why we have the standards that are in the mass spectrometer or in the uh, laser chamber at the same time. So the uranium lead system depends on, on uh, measuring reliably the two different isotopes of uranium, 238, 235. You also have to measure the two daughter products of, of decay. That would be lead 206 and 207 respectively for 238 and 235. And then you also have to be able to measure lead 204. Lead 204 is not a radiogenic daughter product. It's not created by decay of any parent isotope. And so the 204 that's in your sample to begin with is the sample is the 204 that's present in your sample at the present day. We can use that 204 at the present day to tell us how much 206 and 207 was in that sample at time zero when that crystal first formed. And of course you have to be able to subtract out that initial 206 and 207, because otherwise your ages would be that much too old compared to the radiogenic component. So measuring 204 is, is essential for doing this kind of geochronology. 
Measuring lead 204 is very challenging because it has a very low intensity. We usually run at maybe 100 counts per second on 204. It's also challenging because there's an isotope of mercury, mercury 204 sits right on top of lead 204. Our mass spectrometer does not have the mass resolution to separate mercury from lead at mass 204. But fortunately, there's an isotope of mercury at 202. And so we also measure uh, 202 mass position at the same time that we're measuring 204 lead, 206, 207 lead, 235, and 238. We might also introduce into the system the thorium lead decay system. Thorium 232 decays to lead 208. And so you might want to measure both isotopes of uranium plus thorium, three big isotopes of lead, 204, the small one, plus the, the mercury content. So it's great to do this with a multi-collector mass spectrometer because that allows us to measure each of these different isotopes simultaneously. If you were to do this with a single collector, of course, you'd measure 238 with its noise and then 235 with its noise and then 208 and you would get each of those in sequence. Then you'd loop back and do that whole sequence again, right? And the noise of each of those signals would propagate through uh, then to the final uncertainty of the ages that you calculate. But with a multi-collector then, all of these different isotopes are going up and down together. And so much of that instability, that noise cancels out. So you can get much more precise uh, isotope ratios for geochronology using a, a multi-collector mass spectrometer. Because you're measuring all these isotopes at the same time, it also means that you can go much faster. And for, for geochronology, one of the big challenges and opportunities these days is to get larger and larger data sets. Of course, precision, uh, it uh, gets better with the square root of n. So just the more measurements you have, the, the better the precision of those measurements uh, will be. And so for most applications of geochronology, we're now pushing to get bigger and bigger data sets, which means that you go faster, which means that you wanna be able to do those analyses on a, on a multi-collector uh, ICP mass spectrometer. So that's um, pretty much the good news about the, the laser system here. Let me tell you a little bit about the mass spectrometer. This is a, a mass spectrometer made by New Plasma Instruments. Um, the signal, the, uh, ion, uh, the analyte from the laser goes into the torch box here. You can't see it because it's shielded. There's a plasma that you can see through a little window there. That plasma then has the, the ablated material injected through the center of that plasma. That's that atmosphere. That plasma then is focused onto a sample cone, which has a one millimeter aperture. And that's the entrance into the, the rest of the mass spectrometer. That material is pulled into the mass spectrometer because there's a big uh, uh, difference in pressure. This is an atmosphere. The first chamber here, the extraction chamber is at 10 to the minus three. The transfer chamber, the next one is at 10 to the minus seven. And then it's pulled into the analyzer, the flight tube, which is at 10 to the minus nine. So there's a difference in pressure that's pulling that material into the mass spectrometer. There's also a big uh, charge difference. This instrument runs at 6,000 volts of potential between the front end, the torch box here, and the collectors at the downstream end. And so there's a voltage potential carrying those charged ions into the mass spectrometer. So you can probably hear the, the pumps running. There are turbo pumps on this instrument all along the flight tube. The material is pulled through the transfer chain, the transfer lens here, which focuses and collimates that ion beam. They then go into the electrostatic analyzer. This is the first separator here. This is a, an energy filter. They then go to a large magnet, which is underneath here. Big magnetic field. Of course, it obeys the rule of physics, the right-hand rule, magnetic field. Ions flying like this. The ions get bent to the right. So 90 degree bend in the flight tube. And then those ions come out the back end of the magnet through the flight tube here. And they enter into the, the collector block. So the collector assembly here on this mass spectrometer, we have 16 different collectors, right? Because we wanna measure these different isotopes as they're going up and down. So all those collectors are lined up here. We have six, we have uh, 12 Faraday collectors, which are designed to measure uh, large ion intensities. And then we have four ion counters on the low mass side here that uh, collect small ion beams like 204 and 202. Those are our are, are channel, our, our are focused into the collector with these optic lenses here, these zoom optics. They can change the steering of the ion beam. They can change the dispersion of the isotopes. And we want those to be aligned perfectly into those, 
into those different collectors. So let me show you a beam trace here. This is a nice beam trace. These are the, the lead isotopes that we're measuring right now. And you can see that we're looking at uh, 238, 232, 208, 207, and 206. We're not showing the 204 on here. It's basically zero. You wouldn't be able to see any counts on 204. And you can see that the peaks are nicely lined up. Of course, you want to do the measurements right here in the middle on top of these beautiful flat peaks. So really nice peak shapes with this, with this instrument. So the, uh, the heaviest mass is going to be bent the least, right? So we have a collector over here that would be measuring two, 238 uranium. We then have a collector that's measuring 232 thorium. And then over here on the low mass side, right? They get bent more, the lower mass lead isotopes would be 208, 207, and 206. And then 204 and 202 go into ion counters over here on the, on the low mass side. And those are counted all simultaneously as the laser fires. Those ions go through the different uh, parts of the mass spectrometer, get separated, they get counted into collectors. And then as we'll see in a minute, our software over here is uh, counting on those, uh, on those isotope intensities constantly. So let's go look at the software. What we'll do first is we'll go to the laser software. Software. This is the chromium software that comes with the photon machines laser. And what you can see are the zircon crystals. Those are the gray um, tetrahedral shapes there. You can see a bright spot right in the middle. That's the laser that's firing right now. And it just jumped to the next crystal. These uh, analyses are going pretty quickly. There's about three seconds uh, per analysis here. And that, that's because we can take advantage of the efficiency of the multi-collector. So right now it's counting on backgrounds. The laser fires, we start counting on peaks. You can just see the pulse of the laser. This is a seven Hertz, so it fires seven times per second. Moves to the next crystal, counting on backgrounds. And here we go off to another one. So this is a, a very fast, uh, acquisition of uranium lead geochronology. It's only a few seconds per, per measurement. And this allows us to do thousands of these measurements per day. So right now we're on unknowns. We usually do five of these unknowns in a row. Oh, and then we go jump to a standard. So this is a standard crystal. We have a primary standard in there that we know the age of, and we measure the uranium lead ratio of that standard. We then correct it to the to the known value, the true value, and then we apply that same correction factor to the unknowns. So that was the standard, and here we are back on the unknowns again. We do five of those in a row. You can see around each of the pits that's being ablated, there's a, a, a larger ring. So we do that uh, before the start of the analysis. We go through and sit on each grain for just three pulses with the laser with a big spot and we uh, excavate a perfectly clean spot on that crystal. And that's because there's a little bit of mercury, a little bit of, of this lead 204 on the, on the sample surface. This is from polishing and handling. And so we hit it with a cleaning shot with the laser to remove all of that superficial contamination. And then we get to do the analysis uh, in the middle of that clean spot where the, uh, the initial lead and mercury contents are very low. So I think that was number four here, number five. So here we go back to our standard. So we do two different standards as you'll see when we start running the software for data reduction. We do a primary standard to do that initial correction for the fractionation of lead to uranium isotopes. And then we have a secondary standard, standard in there and that we treat like an unknown. And what we, what we calculate is the average age for that secondary standard. And if that secondary standard measured age is the same as the true age, then life is good and we're doing all of our corrections accurately. So we have that secondary standard to kind of check how we're doing. So that's the, the laser system operating. Here's the new plasma software that's operating. And what you see in the central window is the beam trace. The laser is firing right now. So we see high intensity peaks here. These would be the uranium and lead isotopes. The laser just came down, went to backgrounds. We're back on top of the next peak right here. So this is an interesting one, that brown trace at the top there, that's lead 204. And that's telling us that that crystal has a little bit of uh, lead 204 in it. So we're probably not gonna use that one. 
when we um, do look at our data reduction system in our next module, that's one that we're going to probably reject. Oh, we're probably going to reject this one too. Look at how the intensities are increasing as you go down hole in that, during that analysis. That tells you you're probably looking at a zoned crystal, younger on the on the outside, older as you go in deeper. Next one, this looks like a good. You're looking for a flat top on that analysis as you go down hole. This looks like a good one. All the intensities are flat. So we do sit here and watch the analyses as they come off. We're also able to look at all of those different uh, intensities in our data reduction software, as you'll see in our next session. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shut down the, the session here. We'll go to our second session where we uh, take you to the data reduction software and we show you how we handle this data, how we calculate those final ages. We'll kind of emphasize the power of uh, multi-collector multi -collector capability for doing this kind of work. And then after that, we'll come back into the lab and uh, we'll do this live and we'll have some Q&A and discussion about uh, doing uranium lead geochronology by laser ablation ICPMS. Thanks for tuning in.